The Great Gatsby, Chapter 2. About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile, so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke, and finally with the transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Occasionally, a line of gray cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak, and comes to rest, and immediately the ash-gray men swarm up with leaden spades and stir up an impenetrable cloud, which screens their obscure operations from your sight. But above the gray land and the spasms of bleak dust which drift endlessly over it, you perceive after a moment the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic. Their irises are one yard high. They look out of no face, but instead from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which pass over a non-existent nose. Evidently, some wild wag of an oculus set them there to fatten his practice in the borough of Queens, and then sank down himself into eternal blindness, or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes, dimmed a little by many paintless days under sun and rain, brood on over the solemn dumping ground. The Valley of Ashes is bounded on one side by a small foul river, and when the drawbridge is up to let barges through, the passengers on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as half an hour. There is always a halt there of at least a minute, and it was because of this that I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. The fact that he had one was insisted upon wherever he was known. His acquaintances resented the fact that he turned up in popular restaurants with her, and, leaving her at a table, sauntered about chatting with whomsoever he knew. Though I was curious to see her, I had no desire to meet her, but I did. I went up to New York with Tom on the train one afternoon, and when we stopped by the ash heaps, he jumped to his feet, and taking hold of my elbow, literally forced me from the car. We're getting off, he insisted. I want you to meet my girl. I think he tanked up a good deal at luncheon, and his determination to have my company bordered on violence. The supercilious assumption was that on Sunday afternoon I had nothing better to do. I followed him over a low, whitewashed railroad fence, and we walked back a hundred yards along the road under Dr. Eckelberg's persistent stare. The only building in sight was a small block of yellow brick sitting on the edge of the wasteland, a sort of compact main street ministering to it and contiguous to absolutely nothing. One of the three shops it contained was for rent, and another was an all-night restaurant approached by a trail of ashes. The third was a garage, repairs, George B. Wilson, cars bought and sold, and I followed Tom inside. The interior was unprosperous and bare. The only car visible was the dust-covered wreck of a Ford, which crouched in a dim corner. It had occurred to me that this shadow of a garage must be a blind, and that sumptuous and romantic apartments were concealed overhead, when the proprietor himself appeared in the door of an office, wiping his hands on a piece of waste. He was a blonde, spiritless man, anemic and faintly handsome. When he saw us, a damp gleam of hope sprang into his light blue eyes. Well, hello, Wilson, old man, said Tom, slapping him jovially on the shoulder. How's business? Well, I can't complain, answered Wilson unconvincingly. When are you going to sell me that car? Next week. I've got my man working on it now. Works pretty slow, don't he? No, he doesn't, said Tom coldly. And if you feel that way about it, maybe I'd better sell it somewhere else after all. I don't mean that, explained Wilson quickly. I just meant... His voice faded, and Tom glanced impatiently around the garage. Then I heard footsteps on a stairs, and in a moment, the thickish figure of a woman blocked out the light from the office door. She was in the middle thirties and faintly stout, but she carried her surplus flesh sensuously, as some women can. Her face above a spotted dress of dark blue crepe de chine contained no facet or gleam of beauty, but there was an immediately perceptible vitality about her, as if the nerves of her body were continually smoldering. 
She smiled slowly and walking through her husband as if he were a ghost, shook hands with Tom, looking him flush in the eye. Then she wet her lips and without turning around, spoke to her husband in a soft, coarse voice. Get some chairs, why don't you, so somebody can sit down. Oh, sure, agreed Wilson hurriedly and went toward the little office, mingling immediately with the cement color of the walls. A white ashen dust veiled its dark suit and his pale hair as it veiled everything in the vicinity, except his wife, who moved close to Tom. I want to see you, said Tom intently. Get on the next train. All right. I'll meet you by the newsstand on the lower level. She nodded and moved away from him just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs from his office door. We waited for her down the road and out of sight. It was a few days before the 4th of July and a gray, scrawny Italian child was setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad track. Terrible place, isn't it? Said Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckelberg. Awful. It does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object? Wilson, he thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb, he doesn't know he's alive. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up to New York, or not quite, went up together to New York. We're not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. Tom deferred that much to the sensibilities of those East Eggers who might be on the train. She had changed her dress to a brown figured muslin, which stretched tight over her rather wide hips as Tom helped her to the platform in New York. At the newsstand, she bought a copy of Town Tattle and a moving picture magazine, and in the station drugstore, some cold cream and a small flask of perfume. Upstairs in the solemn, echoing drive, she let four taxis drive away before she selected a new one, lavender-colored with gray upholstery, and in this we slid out from the mass of the station into the glowing sunshine. But immediately she turned sharply from the window and, leaning forward, tapped on the front glass. I want to get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I want to get one for the apartment. They're nice to have a dog. We backed up to a gray old man who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. In a basket swung from his neck cowered a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. What kind are they? asked Mrs. Wilson eagerly as he came to the taxi window. All kinds. What do you want, lady? I'd like to get one of those police dogs. I suppose you'd got that kind. The man peered doubtfully into the basket, plunged his hand, and drew one up, wriggling by the back of the neck. That's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man with disappointment in his voice. It's more of an Airedale. He passed his hand over the brown wash rag of a back. Look at that coat. Some coat, that's a dog that'll never bother you with catching a cold. I think it's cute, said Mrs. Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? That dog, he looked admiringly, that dog will cost you ten dollars. The Airedale, undoubtedly there was an Airedale concerned in it somewhere, though its feet were startlingly white, changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Wilson's lap, where she fondled the weatherproof coat with rapture. Is it a boy or a girl? she asked delicately. That dog, that dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. Here's your money. Go and buy ten more dogs with it. We drove over to Fifth Avenue, so warm and soft, almost pastoral, on the summer Sunday afternoon that I wouldn't have been surprised to see a great flock of white sheep turn the corner. Hold on, I said. I have to leave you here. No, you don't, interposed Tom quickly. Myrtle will be hurt if you don't come up to the apartment, won't you, Myrtle? Come on, she urged. I'll telephone my sister, Catherine. She's said to be very beautiful by people who ought to know. Well, I'd like to, but we went on, cutting back again over the park toward the West Hundreds. At 158th Street, the cab stopped at one slice in a long white cake of apartment houses. Throwing a regal homecoming glance around the neighborhood, Mrs. Wilson gathered up her dog and her other purse purchases and went haughtily in. I am going to have the McKees come up, she announced as we rose in the elevator, and of course I got to call up my sister too. The apartment was on the top floor, a small living room, a small dining room, a small bedroom, and a bath. 
The living room was crowded to the doors with a set of tapestried furniture entirely too large for it, so that to move about was to stumble continually over scenes of ladies swinging in the gardens of Versailles. The only picture was an over-enlarged photograph, apparently a hen sitting on a blurred rock. Looked at from a distance, however, the hen resolved itself into a bonnet, and the countenance of a stout old lady beamed down into the room. Several old copies of Town Tattle lay on the table together with a copy of Simon Called Peter and some of the small scandal magazines of Broadway. Mrs. Wilson was first concerned with the dog. A reluctant elevator boy went for a box full of straw and some milk, to which he added, on his own initiative, a tin of large, hard dog biscuits, one of which decomposed apathetically in the saucer of milk all afternoon. Meanwhile, Tom brought out a bottle of whiskey from a locked bureau drawer, door. I have been drunk just twice in my life, and the second time was that afternoon. So everything that happened has a dim, hazy cast over it, although until after eight o'clock the apartment was full of cheerful sun. Sitting on Tom's lap, Mrs. Wilson called up several people on the telephone. Then there were no cigarettes, and I went out to buy some at the drugstore on the corner. When I came back, they had disappeared, so I sat down discreetly in the living room and read a chapter of Simon Called Peter. Either it was terrible stuff, or the whiskey distorted things, because it didn't make any sense to me. Just as Tom and Myrtle, after the first drink, Mrs. Wilson and I called each other by our first names, reappeared, company commenced to arrive at the apartment door. The sister Catherine was a slender, worldly girl of about 30, with a solid, sticky bob of red hair and a complexion powdered milky white. Her eyebrows had been plucked and then drawn on again at a more rakish angle. But the efforts of nature toward the restoration of the old alignment gave a blurred air to her face. When she moved about, there was an incessant clicking as innumerable pottery bracelets jingled up and down upon her arms. She came in with such a proprietary haste and looked around so possessively at the furniture that I wondered if she lived here. But when I asked her, she laughed immoderately, repeated my question aloud, and told me she lived with a girlfriend at a hotel. Mr. McKee was a pale, feminine man from the flat below. He had just shaved, for there was a white spot of lather on his cheekbone, and he was most respectful in his greeting to everyone in the room. He informed me that he was in the artistic game, and I gathered later he was a photographer and had made the dim enlargement of Wils Mrs. Wilson's mother, which hovered like an ectoplasm on the wall. His wife was shrill, languid, handsome, and horrible. She told me with pride that her husband had photographed her 127 times since they had been married. Mrs. Wilson had changed her costume some time before and was now attired in an elaborate afternoon dress of cream-colored chiffon, which gave out a continual rustle as she swept about the room. With the influence of the dress, her personality had also undergone a change. The intense vitality that had been so remarkable in the garage was converted into impressive hauteur. Her laughter, her gestures, her assertions became more violently affected moment by moment, and as she expanded, the room grew smaller around her, until she seemed to be revolving on a noisy, creaking pivot through the smoky air. All right, I'm going to pause it here and then do the second half.